have to talk to us. If there's a question you don't want to answer, don't answer it. If you don't want to talk anymore, just tell me I want to. I'm, tell me I want to leave. And I'm kind of in the way of the door. But you're not being uh, you're, you're not being uh, interrogated as a criminal suspect. We're here to understand uh, your relationship with Chris and what you know about Chris and his family and uh, events relating to Chris Watts. Uh, and do you know him as Chris or Christopher? A timeline of your uh, getting to know Chris, how you guys met, where you met, all those things. And let's just run. And I, I'm not going to ask you specific questions unless I think it's necessary. I'll let you just tell me your story. I think it's a little bit easier that way. So I just want to know how you met him, where you met him, how long you guys were dating, uh, and those kind of things initially. Okay. Um, I think I met him sometime in June, probably early June. It might have been May. It was just talking at work. It was pretty casual. Um, and uh, he didn't have a wedding ring on his finger. And every time I talked to him, he didn't tell me that he was in a relationship. He didn't even mention his kids right away either. Um, and then one day he told me that he had two kids. I was like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> And they started telling me about his kids. That sounded like a sarcastic comment. No, I thought it was kind of cute. I was like, oh, he's a dad. It was like right around Father's Day, too. So whenever that is, it's in June. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not good with holidays. He told me he had kids, and then it was Father's Day shortly after okay. that. So that's what I do now. And I was like, I know, I thought it was cute. And then um, he's telling me about him. He's pretty excited about him. And then... Um, he mentioned that he did have a significant other and then he told me that those two were in the process of a separation did he mention the children's name or his significant other's name um i didn't know his significant other's name for a while and then i think he told me his kids names pretty quick but to be honest with you on an exact date of when that happened Being the text to you where it's like, don't, don't, like, don't say those words to me and then go try to make peace with your wife and lay in bed with another woman. Like, just don't do that. And I was like, it's not that I don't appreciate what you're saying to me. It's like, just, like, he wanted to take care of it. Like, any time that his kids could be in, like, his life for uh, hours or days or whatever, whenever they were home, I made sure that I wasn't a presence in his life so that he could be the best dad that he needed to be. Um... And, I mean, I thought what we had, it was very comfortable for me. I enjoyed it. I think he did very much as well. You guys, you, six, eight weeks, two months, whatever it was, you guys had an intimate relationship during that time? Yes. Okay. So, you're, you're pretty serious. Um, did, did he ever tell you that he loved you? Yes, he did. Did you ever tell him the same? A couple times. Okay. Um, now, we're standing that today because that may, those thoughts may have changed for you, but on, let's go mon Sunday into Monday or Monday, did you, did you still love him on those days? I think it was something where it was like, I, I said it a few times and I meant it, but he definitely felt the urge to say it to me a lot more than I did to him because it was just all very new to me. And it was like, take your time with this. Like, you don't need to to like rush that you know like I remember when he was in North Carolina and he was like trying to patch things up with his wife and he told me he loved me and I was like don't say that to me like please go try to fit and I mean and that might even be in the text too where it's like don't don't like don't say those words to me and then go try to make peace with your wife and lay in bed with another woman like just don't do that and I was like it's not that I don't appreciate what you're saying to me it's like just it just didn't sit right for me, you know? So I just feel like... It was like an insecurity where he had to say that to you? I, I... In the stark and troubling narrative of the Chris Watts case, one aspect remains shrouded in mystery, a question to which we may never have a definitive answer. The extent of Nicole Kessinger's involvement has sparked widespread speculation and debate. Notably, due to the fact that she engaged in a phone conversation with Watts, lasting approximately 111 minutes on the night of August 12, 2018, ending just before midnight. This has become a focal point of scrutiny. This was one of his final communications 
before the horrific events unfolded the next morning. This detail raises critical questions. Could she have been attempting to dissuade him? Or, as some speculate, might she have played a role in fanning the flames of the impending tragedy? Our exploration today seeks to delve into these complexities, striving for clarity amidst the swirling speculation. The big question that invariably arises when delving into the Watt story is what occurred during the 111-minute phone call between Nicole Kessinger and Watts on the night before the Watts family is brutally murdered, buried, and then reported missing. It's a natural assumption in today's digital era that such a conversation might have been recorded and retrievable by law enforcement. However, the actual practices of telecommunications and legal constraints tell a different story. Contrary to the common belief, which might be influenced by portrayals in TV and movies or misunderstandings about devices like Alexa, phone companies do not routinely record or store the content of personal phone calls. Alexa devices, for instance, record snippets of conversations for processing and user experience, improvement upon hearing a wake word. But telecommunications, governed by stringent privacy laws, do not engage in indiscriminate recording of calls. Thus, without prior suspicion or evidence warranting a wiretap, and there was no reason for one in this case, it's highly unlikely that the call between Kessinger and Watts was recorded by the phone company. As a result, without a wiretap in place, the content of their conversation likely remains known only to Kessinger and Watts. All that is left is the metadata of the time, date, and duration of the call, and a wealth of hypotheses and conjectures from those seeking to understand the how and why of the case. If the police had access to the content of the call, they have not released any information or transcripts, fueling public speculation. Questions linger. Was Kessinger attempting to dissuade Watts, or could she have been a catalyst for his actions? Without concrete evidence, these queries enter the realm of speculation. While it's in human nature to seek answers, particularly in a case as harrowing as this, the likelihood of a recording of that pivotal phone call existing is minimal due to the legal and technical barriers involved. Consequently, we are confronted with an unsettling gap in the narrative. In the complex tapestry of Nicole Kessinger's life before meeting Chris Watts, our understanding is based on a patchwork of public information, some of which may not be entirely accurate. She was born in Colorado in 1988. Kessinger charted a course marked by scholarly pursuits and professional vigor. Her academic path led her to Colorado State University where she delved into the realms of geology, earth science, and geoscience, earning a bachelor's degree in geology in 2013. Further honing her skills, she attained an associate of science degree from Aurora Community College. Kessinger's professional journey began with a role as a bookkeeper, showcasing her diverse abilities. Her career then aligned more closely with her academic foundations, as she entered the field of engineering. Her tenure at Halliburton was as an MWD field engineer, which spanned nearly a decade, underscored her dedication and skill. This chapter of her career culminated in a promotion to project manager at RK Mechanical. While much of Kessinger's early life and career path appears to reflect a typical, albeit ambitious, path, it is crucial to acknowledge the gaps in our knowledge. As a researcher, I have not had the opportunity to interview Kessinger personally, and thus, my understanding of her life is drawn from limited public information. While she seems to have led a relatively normal life, steeped in academic and professional pursuits, it is essential to consider the role she might have played in influencing Chris Watts. If, indeed, she played any part in convincing Watts to commit his heinous acts, it would mark a stark and tragic departure from what, up to that point, 
seemed to be a life of ordinary aspirations and achievements. Chris Watts navigated his career at Anadarko Petroleum. A significant professional development occurred his transition from a rover to a field coordinator role. This shift, marked by increased office presence, coincided with the onset of his acquaintance with Nicole Kessinger. Their initial encounters, framed within the professional confines of their workplace, gradually evolved into a more personal rapport. The transition from professional colleagues to something more personal was subtle, yet pivotal. It began with a seemingly innocuous text from Kessinger to Watts during one of his field assignments. This exchange sparked a series of communications that slowly veered away from work-related discussions, hinting at a developing mutual interest. The nature of their relationship began to crystallize, following Watts' trip to San Diego with his wife in late June. Shortly after this trip, Watts and Kessinger arranged their first meeting outside of work, choosing a public park in Thornton for this purpose. This meeting marked a turning point where their relationship stepped out of the professional realm. During the month of July, as Shanann Watts, along with their children, was visiting family in North Carolina, the relationship between Kessinger and Watts deepened significantly. Watts found himself increasingly at Kessinger's residence, a decision that underscored the seriousness of their affair. This period was crucial in setting the stage for the tragic events that would later unfold highlighting a stark contrast between Watts' domestic life and his developing relationship with Kessinger. Amidst the professional corridors of Anadarko Petroleum, a notable shift in Chris Watts' career trajectory unfolded as he transitioned from the role of a rover to a field coordinator. This change, significant for its increased requirement of office presence, marked the beginning of Watts' acquaintance with Nicole Kessinger. What started as routine professional interactions within the office walls gradually transformed, blurring the lines between professional and personal spheres. The metamorphosis of their relationship from mere colleagues to something more intricate was a gradual process. It all started with a simple text message from Kessinger during Watt's fieldwork, serving as a catalyst for a series of ensuing communications. These exchanges, initially anchored in work-related matters, slowly diverged, revealing an undercurrent of mutual interest. A distinct shift in their relationship's nature became apparent following Watt's trip to San Diego with Shannon in late June. Upon his return, the first out-of-office meeting between Watts and Kessinger took place a discreet rendezvous at a park in Thornton. This encounter signified a pivotal moment, steering their relationship beyond professional boundaries. During July, as Shannon and their children visited relatives in North Carolina, the bond between Kessinger and Watts intensified. Watts, frequent overnight, stays at Kessinger's residence during this period were indicative of the deepening intimacy of their affair. This time marked a critical juncture laying the groundwork for the harrowing events that were to ensue and cast a stark contrast to Watts' life as a family man. In his reflections, Watts drew comparisons between his relationships with Shanann and Kessinger. He described his marriage to Shanann as one where she was the more dominant partner, often steering family decisions. This dynamic, he claimed, was in contrast to his equation with Kessinger, which he perceived as more of an equal partnership valuing his opinions. Their first official date, intended to be a movie outing that morphed into a casual walk due to unforeseen circumstances, marked the beginning of a series of unique experiences for Watts with Kessner. Whether it was exploring Watts' past as a mechanic through a museum visit, experiencing drag racing for the first time since his marriage, or embarking on his inaugural camping trip each activity with Kessinger was a departure from his routine life. Watts' recollections of his early days with Shanann, particularly their first upscale movie date in North Carolina, contrasted starkly with his experiences with Kessinger. The initial differences in their preferences and Shanann's upfront assessment of Watts not being her type were memories he pondered upon. 
Yet, he pursued Shanann, despite the initial mismatch. In his relationship with Kessinger, however, he felt a role reversal. He was the one being pursued. Reflecting on his time with Kessinger, Watts described being engulfed in the exhilaration of a new relationship. He admitted to investigators his inner conflict, recognizing the wrongfulness of his actions, but being overtaken by his emotions. He likened the experience to relentless roller coaster ride, one that he continually fueled, unable to find the will to disengage. This constant pursuit of excitement with Kessinger, especially during the month of July, when he spent no nights at his family home, created a detachment from his responsibilities as a husband and father. Watts shared with investigators his awareness of how his actions might have appeared to others engaging in enjoyable activities and dates while his family was away, creating a facade of casual fun. However, when in Kessinger's company, he felt as though he was in a different world, one where the reality of his family life faded into the background. In hindsight, Watts reflected, it seemed as though I was simply enjoying myself while my wife and kids were on vacation. That wasn't my intention, but in retrospect, that's the impression it gave. When you're out tamping, attending drag races, and engaging in activities you find enjoyable, but with someone who isn't part of your family, it sends a certain message. It didn't feel right, yet when I was with Nicole, those thoughts and responsibilities seemed to vanish. I was caught up in a wave of exhilaration and novelty, one that I couldn't, or perhaps didn't want to, step away from. The whirlwind affair between Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger is a stark reminder of how individuals can get swept away in the moment, leading to actions that betray their commitments. Affairs, while hurtful and often devastating to relationships, are not uncommon in human experience. They are understandable and, in some contexts, forgivable, though perhaps not by the betrayed spouse. This notion is reflected in the divorce statistics of 2023, where a significant percentage of marital breakdowns were attributed to infidelity. Such incidents speak to a facet of human nature, the search for connection, even when it leads one down a path of moral complexity. However, the case of Chris Watts veers sharply from the narrative of a typical affair. On a fateful day in 2018, Watts committed an act that was unfathomable to most the murder of his own family. This extreme and tragic decision raises profound questions. What could have led him to believe that such a heinous act was the only solution to continue his relationship with Kessinger? It begs the question of whether Kessinger played a role in shaping his mindset knowingly or unknowingly, or if she was merely a catalyst in a scenario that Watts orchestrated. Theories abound regarding Kessinger's involvement or influence. Some speculate that she may have been like Iago from Shakespeare's Othello, whispering manipulative thoughts into Watts' ear though there is no concrete evidence to support such claims. Others hypothesize that the lengthy phone conversation they had the night before the murders was a turning point, possibly ending their relationship, leading to a rage-induced reaction from Nicole, and she is the murderer, and Chris confessed only because he actually loved Nicole. Yet, these remain within the realm of speculation and conspiracy, without substantive proof. The circumstances of the murders, especially the disposal of the bodies, add to the complexity of the case. The decision to hide the bodies of Watt's daughters in oil tanks and to bury his wife in a shallow grave not only speaks to the heinous nature of the crime, but also raises questions about premeditation and planning. Did Kessinger ever imagine being implicated in a murder plot? Or was she unaware of the depths of Watts' despair and willingness to commit such an atrocity? Yes, infidelity 
and the human tendency to get caught up in the moment are parts of the larger human experience. The Chris Watts case transcends these common narratives. The extreme nature of his actions, the speculation surrounding Kessinger's influence, and the conspiracy theories about her possible direct involvement all paint a picture far removed from the usual story of extramarital affairs. It's a reminder that while affairs can be complex and emotionally charged, they seldom justify, let alone lead to, the kind of tragic outcome seen in this case. Who truly is Nicole Kessinger? In the public eye, she's become something of an enigma, a figure shrouded in controversy and dark speculation. Some people call her the most hated woman in the country right now. The story is rife with chilling possibilities. Did Chris Watts act alone in his heinous crime, or was it Kessinger, or both? There are a few things I know for certain. Kessinger is now living comfortably under the veil of witness protection, and Chris Watts is in a prison cell. Why is she under witness protection? Some think that it's because Watts, in a twisted act of devotion, took the fall to save her. Others speculate darker reasons, and we, the public, will never know what actually happened and why. Thank you for tuning into Deliberately Deadly. This tale, like many, leaves us hanging in the shadows of doubt and helpless to the horror of the crime itself. This crime is especially heinous, and because that there is always room for more discussion, though I'm not sure we will ever have definitive answers. Share your thoughts in the comments, what is the truth? Don't forget to subscribe and share. I'm currently looking for a new topic for next time, and I would love to hear your suggestions. Join me next time as we delve into another labyrinth of human enigma and sinister deeds. And he's like, I think she'll be back tonight. Like, I think she's like out with somebody. And he was telling me that they had had a disagreement. So I was like, well, I remember telling him, I was like, you should make sure that you have a, fr oh, um, wait a minute. No, no, no. So all that happened. And then it starts getting kind of laid out. And I remember we talked for text for a while and part of this conversation, and then it moved to the phone. Um, and I remember telling him, because he was like, I think she'll just be back tomorrow. I think she's just going to be gone for the night, like, with a friend, you know? And Did like, you name the friend? No, he didn't. And, like, I, well, and because I, I don't think, he made it sound like he didn't know, like, what friend's house she would be at. And I remember talking to him, and I was like, well, maybe it's that Nikki girl. And he's like, well, Nikki called the cops, so why would she be at Nikki's house? I'm like, I don't know, kind of throws her off the trail of where she's at, you know? And it's like, it sounds kind of weird, but it's like, I, he really made this sound like this woman was just, like, upset, left the house. And that was probably what he thought happened to her. And so I, I didn't really put too much, like... Did he tell you the kids were missing as well? Yes, I knew. I mean, which made sense to me, because I was like, well, if you were at work all day... I mean, he didn't tell me he got home early. He didn't...